journalism called to Margaret Sullivan from her hometown newspaper, The Buffalo News, where she started as an intern and left years later, having served as the first woman editor and vice president. Lured away to become the New York Times' first female public editor, she reported directly to the publisher as an advocate for those who consumed the daily newspaper. Sullivan created her position of media columnist at the Washington Post to cover an entirely new world of print, online, and app-driven media from a journalist perspective. Her book, Ghosting the News, portends the grim future of local journalism as areas of the United States become news deserts. The, what, one thing that people can do is they can subscribe to their local paper. Spokesman Review editor Rob Curley leads the discussion on this crisis as we welcome Margaret Sullivan to the virtual Northwest Passages stage. So another part that I want to touch on is the haves and the have-nots of journalism. What, what do you see? You have lived in that world, both in Buffalo, uh, though you, you were owned by somebody who had a little bit of money. Uh, <laughs> yes, I was, our, the paper was owned by Warren Buffett or by Berkshire Hathaway, which basically is Warren Buffett. So, um, so that was, you know, you have to pick your billionaires. And so far I've managed to pick Warren Buffett and Jeff Bezos. So, you know, could be worse. But um, yes, the, the haves and the have nots is a, is a really, I mean, that phrase about journalism comes from a really good Wall Street Journal story that, um, that they ran at least a year ago that basically identified that, you know, local papers were really struggling and that there were a couple national papers, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal and, and the Washington Post that were able to do much better um, financially because they were able to appeal to a national or even global audience. And so they were able to sort of, you know, find this revenue that came from a very broad audience where local papers were struggling because they had always relied on local print advertising, which had gone away. So it's creating this system in which it seems like we're headed for a situation in which there will only be, I mean, I hope this isn't true. And I think Spokane hel helps to show that it doesn't have to be that way. But I think in many places we're headed for a situation where there's a few big national survivors. And in a lot of communities where there has been like a robust newspaper, not so much anymore. And, and that, you know, that's, that's, where the, that's where the trouble comes is it's really not, you know, people want to say to me, well, the reason that newspapers are struggling is because you're biased or it's because you make mistakes in stories. Well, those things are bad. We don't want to be biased and we don't want to make mistakes in stories, but that's actually not at the root of this. What's at the root of it is that our business model in many cases has kind of disintegrated under our feet. And, and, Later in the book, you you make that point um, where uh, you say, you say, if the old model is broken, what will work in its place? To which the answer is nothing. Nothing will work. There is no general model for newspapers to replace the one that the internet just broke. Now that's pretty sad, but, but the next one is even worse. One well-intentioned journalism advocate wrote off newspapers by saying that ship has sailed. The idea that we have a news ecosystem ready to replace newspapers is just false. So, yeah. so is there hope? Well, there, there, there is hope, but um, it's, 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 it's not one single answer. Um, it's not like, oh, we're going to revive newspapers and everything will be just like it was in the mid nineties. That will not happen. Um, but what can happen and what should happen, and there's some evidence that it will happen, is that we can shore up newspapers, we can help these new organizations to thrive, we can um, we can you know encourage collaboration so that you know I'll give you one example of collaboration um, in Pennsylvania. There's an outfit called Spotlight PA, Spotlight Pennsylvania, a bunch of different news organizations that have gotten together to 
to provide good state house coverage because state house coverage is one of the things that has declined more than anything. Um, it's it's really gone downhill and it's extremely important because that's where a lot of our tax dollars are spent and it's where a lot of our public officials do good or bad things. So it's really important to not be fully competing against each other for scoops or whatever, but instead trying to pool our resources a little bit. And we really do have to think differently about how we conduct ourselves as journalists. And you know, one of the problems is it's kind of not in our DNA to, or I mean, I hope it can be found within our DNA, but it's not obvious within our DNA to collaborate rather than compete. The competitive urge is very, very strong and it's hard to snuff that out. And I don't think we wanna snuff it out altogether. I think we wanna find ways to, yes, um, still do you know work that keeps us on our toes, but also pool those resources when it makes sense. So you, you give a lot of examples of, of things that are very distressing and, and, and some, some, some lights of uh, rays of hope. But I want to talk about Youngstown, Ohio, because you, uh, in our industry, we know about it because it was a, a daily paper that closed and it recently, but you were actually there. Walk us through what all that was like. So, you know, at the time, uh, you know, most of the time I live, it's kind of confusing. I work for the Washington Post, but I'm based in New York City. But in the summer, I hang out in my old hometown near Buffalo um, at a cottage. So last summer, I was staying at this cottage near Buffalo. So I'm already in the Rust Belt, right? I'm already among like, you know, steel mills that have gone down and car industry that's suffering. And I, so therefore, I'm closer to and particularly attuned to this announcement that happens in Youngstown, Ohio, out of the blue, that the paper that had existed for 150 years was going to close its doors the following month. This was July, and in August, it was going to go away. It wasn't going to go partly, you know, deliver a couple times a week or scale back. No, it was going to go from a full-scale, seven-day-a-week delivery Thing that the community had had for 150 years, family owned, by the way, to nothingness, the Youngstown Vindicator. So at that point, I figured, well, it would be a good idea to go to Youngstown <laughs> and see what was up. And I hung out in the newsroom and I met a bunch of editors and reporters. And I went to this community meeting, which was really interesting because the community had really just found out that the next, in the next couple of weeks, they were going to lose their paper. And people were in tears and these were people who had delivered the paper or their dad's obit had been in the paper or you know their son's touchdown was in the you know all these different ways that they were connected to the they called it the vindy it was like a big part of the community the vindicator the vindy so i'm at this meeting and people are crying and saying we need to save it how are we going to save it could we turn it into a nonprofit? And meanwhile, you know, none of that is going to happen. It's going out of business. They made the decision. Um, and I, you know, one of the parts that I remember most vividly is talking to one of the editors who I had gotten to know who said, well, that it was very poignant, you know, to hear people um, so sad that we're going to close. But I wonder what would have happened if there'd been a show of hands and we'd ask people how many subscribers are actually, how many of you actually subscribe to the paper, you know, seven days a week or five days a week or whatever it was. And his thought was, uh-uh, these are not, because circulation had plummeted. So people might've had a romantic idea that they liked the paper and maybe they benefited from it, but they weren't necessarily supporting it. And this is one of the big takeaways for me is, you know, you don't know what you got till you lose it. Think about what our cities, our towns would be like if that newspaper simply weren't around anymore. Not shrunken, not part of the time, gone. That's happening all over the country. 2,000 papers have gone out of business since 2004. It's actually more now because since the pandemic and the economic downturn, a bunch more have gone out of business. I mean, this is, it's actually heartbreaking and it's, it's actually a terrible thing for our country. So 
some there's many ways people are trying to fix this and one is through as you mentioned within the vindicator a nonprofit model or, or some sort of hybrid model and we see Linfest in Philadelphia uh, ProPublica is definitely doing some interesting big big J journalism and we, the Knight Foundation and here in Spokane we've benefited from Report for America we have three Report for America reporters and then we have a local foundation that really supports us strongly um, but is there a problem in your mind with that like is is donor uh, uh, supported coverage good or bad well um, if we're going to you know, find a new model, we're going to we're going to need donors. We're going to need membership by regular people, and we're going to need big, deep-pocketed donors as well. Um, I think what has to happen is there has to be a way to build into these systems some safeguards, you know, some guardrails, so that the donors aren't saying, "Oh yeah, you know, about that story you guys are going to do." that um, might make me look bad. I'd prefer you not to do that. And if you do it, you know, maybe next year's donation is gonna go away. You know, you, you just can't have that because the main thing that we need to be as journalists and as news organizations is independent. And when we lose that independence, we got nothing because it's about our credibility. I mean, it, it, at the Buffalo News where I was for so many years, you know, for years and years, decades, the, the rule was you would never see an ad salesman in the newsroom. They just weren't allowed to even walk by. You know, it just was the wall between the business side and the news side was that strong. So in a donor, in a donor supported system, you have to also be thinking about how are we going to protect the journalism from people who may be well intentioned but are human beings and won't like a critical story that hurts their friend or whatever it is. And you know what? The big donors in a, in a, in a community are often the powerful people who are at the top of organizations. These are, you know, the Venn diagram it actually has quite an intersection of sets there. So, uh, that, so that's part of the problem. And then you get into the problem of, you know, if you ever get into direct subsidy from government, similarly, I mean, you know, we know right now that we have a, an administration in the Trump administration that is not friendly to, to news organizations. You know, do we want the federal government to be driven by that? And how do you protect against that as well? So internally, we, we looked at Cal Matters because they had a very good donor policy and we, we very much em emulated that. But you just said something that's, that's, that's important to know. Uh, it's called the fourth estate for a reason. I mean, we're, we're supposed to be the checks and balances for the checks and balances. Right. There is talk now of a bill that would, would, would benefit news organizations in some way. How do you feel about a bill that gives tax breaks to someone who subscribes to a newspaper? Uh, well, I'll tell you what, there was a time when I used to feel like, oh, you know, we don't want any of that stuff. It's, it's a, it's a muddling of, uh, of things and there's better ways to do it. But well, I think the, you know, I guess my feeling on it now is we have to have a radical rethinking of, of all of these ideas that seemed so uh, clear before. I mean, I don't think, a ta you know, if, if, if we can give people a tax exemption to subscribe to their paper, if they can get a tax exemption for that, I, I find it hard to see what would be wrong with that. Um, you know, there's another thing that's, that's being kicked around in Congress, which, you know, some people think is wrong, but um, which would give um, a, a, a limited antitrust exemption to publishers, newspaper publishers, so that they can bargain more effectively against Google and Facebook, which are the two, the duopoly as they're known, which suck up so much digital advertising. And so, you know, if you're the, whatever, the Seattle Times and you're trying to negotiate against Google and Facebook, I mean, that's worse than David and Goliath. I don't know what it is, but if they can get, if these publishers can get together and have a limited time of an antitrust exemption so that they can kind of make some progress on this, um, there might be a slightly more even playing field. And I think that is uh, reasonable and a good thing. So your, your book is filled with this sort of, of knowledge. So I want to make sure you go, you get this. And if you live in the Spokane area, 
you need to get it at aunties because because we won't support our local bookstore but also uh our book club has always made it so it's easy to get signed books i promise you we're going to fix that we, we we're going to we're going to get autograph plates from margaret so that you can have an autographed copy of of your book so we're getting a ton of questions and i want to run and some of these are very right where we're talking about mm -hmm. uh q would like to know how does local television uh uh, hold up as a viable news source c compared to national uh, news television? Well, I think local television is a really important part of this, you know, the future. Um, and, you know, local and, and national TV uh, network news and local news do very, very different kinds of things. And we all know this because, you know, we, for however much we watch it, we do watch it. And we know that, you know, local TV news is very oriented toward the visual. It's very oriented toward like what happened today and what can I show people? It tends to be um, pretty focused on, or it often is focused on things like crime, sports, weather, and so on. These things aren't bad. They need to be covered and people value them. But I've also seen TV stations now start to do more investigative and more enterprise coverage in part so they can differentiate themselves from their TV competitors. So that's where competition I think is, is a good thing. Um, I mean, I, I hope that that can continue and that they can do more of the kind of work that has, you know, sort of lasting value in our democracy. Um, you know, as to how it measures up against, against national news, I mean, I think the subject matter is just so different, um, but they both, at times fall prey to the same kinds of faults, which are, um, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way, but they can be somewhat superficial and they can be somewhat glancing just because their resources and particularly the time they have, you know, you've got a half hour and some of it is ads and you've got to cover a whole bunch of stuff. So how are you going to really dig in? But that's, to some extent, I see that changing and I'm encouraged by that. Yeah. So uh, we have another question. Do you think social media apps can work for journalism or is the group think mentality just too biased? Well, I mean, social media is the ultimate, you know, double edged sword for journalism. It's, it's, it's good for journalism in the sense that, wow, my story that I wrote can be shared by so many people. It can be seen by people all over the world and, and I can really get the word out. And I can even source my stories a little bit on social media. You know, I can find people. I can, you know, it's an incredible tool. But what happens, as we know, is that it tends to separate very quickly into these echo chambers where you're going to find your group of people who, are, who will reinforce what you already think. And I think that's sort of the opposite of a really strong daily newspaper, which puts forth um, a, a variety of ideas and all with a basis of verifiable fact. So, you know, social media has a tendency um, because there aren't a lot of fact checking mechanisms there to allow rumors and um, disinformation to circulate. You know, during the 26, just one tiny example, but during the 2016 campaign, you know, there were all of these thousands of memes and false stories known as you know, that can be called fake news. And, you know, one of them was that the Pope had endorsed Donald Trump. And this, you know, went around or that Hillary Clinton was dying of some terrible disease or that she was terribly sick and was laid up. And I mean, these things, and there's no way, you know, it's sort of like once the genie is out of the bottle on this, on this false information, there's really no way to pull it back. And if anything, that's gotten worse and worse. So, you know, when a newspaper makes a mistake, a bad mistake, or even a medium mistake, they fix it. They fix it and they run a correction. That's how you know that, you know, it, it helps with the, with the issue of trust. Um, none of that exists on social media and it's just sort of the wild west in many ways. So Dave has a question that's, that's very similar to what we're talking about. If local news, uh, papers disappear or when they disappear, are you fearful that the main source of news would become social media? And do you feel like social media tends to be influenced by uh, interference? 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it. we know that it is in, more easily influenced by foreign or even domestic interference. Uh, I am fearful of that. And, you know, this, this came out in that congressional race that we were talking about um, when this Congress um, congressional, uh, uh, you know, would be congressional um, member of Congress candidate went out to these places that were less served by local news. He said, you know, they weren't seeing news from a newspaper. They were getting it from talk radio, um, from Facebook, and from kind of rumor. And that's not very good information. Yeah. So uh, question from Karen. Filipino journalist Maria Ressa was, uh, was arrested, thrown in jail, convicted this summer on libel charges, and faces six years in prison. She said, in the battle for truth, journalism is activism. Do you agree with that? And how do jur US journalistic rules and norms need to adopt if the new normal is going to become alternative facts? Wow, that's a very sophisticated question and, and it's appreciated. I had the chance to meet Maria Ressa um, a, a while back and she's a really admirable and I think heroic journalist who has really suffered um, in her native country where she's, she's you know, formed this uh, news organization called Rappler. Um, that does great work. And I worry about her and, and her future. Um, you know, I think that journalism, you know, I don't see it necessarily as activism. I see it as, it, as something that has to, you, you know, I think journalism has to stand for something. Um, and I think what it has to stand for among the things it has to stand for are, for example, press rights, uh, the rule of law, um, you know, civil rights, and I have no problem when journalists stand up for those things. I don't think we need to be f sort of falsely neutral on the subject of press rights, for example. I mean, if we don't stand up for that stuff, I really don't know who's going to. So, you know, at the same time, I don't really like the idea of journalists, reporters being involved in partisan causes, because I think it cuts away at the idea of trust. Um, you know, if I'm if one day I'm out with a picket sign and the next day I'm writing a story, um, I can understand why somebody would think I'm not coming to it with a completely impartial point of view. So uh, this is a question that I already know the answer to, but I, I want to make sure that I love it when readers ask questions, you know, like, and, and to me, there aren't any dumb ones. There are just, I should have explained this to you earlier, but we had a question, uh, are national news, news feeds influenced by political action committees or special interest groups? Um, you know, I, I suppose there are all kinds of influences that are hard to account for. The best journalists are not influenced by those things. They're independent minded. And, you know, I've gotten to know some of the best journalists in the country. And, and, and I would say some of them are local journalists. And, you know, they, one of the things that characterizes the, these, these fine reporters and these people who are at the top of their crafts is that they can't be bought. They can't, and I don't mean just by money, they can't be bought by influence peddling. They can't be bought by the promise of a scoop. They can't be bought by access. They truly have an independent mindset. And that's the thing that they bring their readers that's so incredibly important. And I am idealistic about this, and so are they. You know, the, the great reporters like David Farenthold at the Washington Post and, you know, Jody Cantor, who, who unveiled the Harvey Weinstein story at the New York Times, and Julie K. Brown, the Epstein story at the Miami Herald. You, there's nothing you could do to influence those people uh, uh, other than, you know, by telling them the truth and, and helping them get the truth. So I, I want to go to a couple of quotes from your book, but one is from your former boss, who is very famous for, for buying staples that never go out of style, you know, like railroads and ketchup. And Are you talking about Warren Buffett now? Yes, I am. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and he's always uh, been very, very high on newspapers. Um, but in 2019, he, he said point blank, they're going to disappear. And then another one, uh, at least of a coworker, but not a boss, uh, Dean Bicat said um, uh, even, even, even more hardcore, I think most local newspapers in America are gonna die in the next five years, except for the ones that have been bought by a local billionaire. 
do you have any like a list of these local billionaires that you can send me or uh, yeah. <laughs> what, well, what's your pick on those two things? I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not as, um, my point of view, despite all the research I did for this book and my own experience is not as dark as those two would have it. Um, I do not think that most, almost all newspapers will be gone in five years. I mean, that already was a year ago. And yes, we've seen a bunch of newspapers go out of business, but I also think we've seen some, some hopeful signs and some shoring up. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very discouraging. It has been very discouraging to see Warren Buffett sell his papers, including the Buffalo News, um, even though he sold them not to a hedge fund, but to a newspaper chain, uh, the Lee Enterprises that he has respect for. You know, I, I think there are ways to make this work. And I think, you know, Rob, you know this, You're, you've found ways in Spokane to, to make it work. And we need to be thinking positively about this and making our case to the public that they actually do need us. And we, you know, they need us and we need them. And, and let's make it work. Do you see uh, dark sides tied to the hedge fund ownership? Well, yes, yes, I do. Uh, that's a little hard to get away from. You know, hedge funds are now buying up uh, all these newspapers, and it's never a good sign. I mean, some are worse than others, but um, you know, these days it's not at all unusual to work for a once great newspaper that all of a sudden is owned by a hedge fund, and you know, you're basically just waiting for them to cut the staff to ribbons. And, um, and when you cut the newsroom staff, you are really limiting your ability to do good work. I mean, there's no such thing as doing more with less. When you have less, you do less. And um, I don't know any way around that. So that's a bad development. And yes, I sure wish there was a, you know, a deep pocketed billionaire in every community. But I'll tell you this, even in places that, that have a billionaire owner, these, these people do not want, they're not in the business, they don't want to be in the business of just dishing out money. They want to find a way to help the paper write itself and be profitable. For example, the Los Angeles Times, which is owned by, I think, um, the man who's identified as the richest doctor in the world, Patrick Soonshung. Um, you know, what he wants to see happen is for subscriptions, digital subscriptions to increase to the point where the paper is making it on its own. And, and actually the Washington Post, which is owned by Jeff Bezos, has managed to do that. The paper's profitable now. And he said what he wanted to give us was runway, enough runway so that we could fly the plane on our own. Our, our owner in Spokane has a similar take. You know, yes. He does not want to keep losing money in any way, no. but he wants to make sure we have enough runway to, to try to succeed. Right. So I want to know what's what's you're one of the few people who could really talk about the personalities and differences between the New York Times and the Washington Post. What, 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 how do you see the two? Well, you know, um, my view on this is a little tainted in a way, because when I was at the New York Times, I was the so-called public editor. So I was like the internal watchdog. Um, and uh, it's some people describe it as the, the worst job in journalism, because you're among all these relatively large egos, uh, people who've made their way to the New York Times and are pretty proud of that. Um, and you're there to sort of hold them to account on, the be on behalf of the readers. So when you do that, you are, you know, I was a part of the organization, I was employed by the Times and I came to work there every day, but it's not quite the same thing. Whereas at the Post, you know, I am a true member of the newsroom. Um, I mean, they both do great work. They both have, have great journalists. The Times is bigger and it's more global. Um, I would say the Post is often, perhaps as a result of that, more nimble and quicker to turn on a dime and maybe quicker to make change. Um, the Times always seems to be very aware of its role in sort of this, its historic role as the paper of record and that, you know, you're going to go back and you know, view history through what it, it does, it, that, that looms very large there. And it can be, you know, it can be both a positive and, and a negative force. It can mean that things are slower to change um, 
and they can be a little more hidebound. So I, I don't want to keep you on the, a lot longer, but I do, we got a, one great question and I want to have you wrap things up from Daniel. This is a great one. It seems like anyone raised in the digital age, especially 40 and under, doesn't seem to value or understand the idea of the fourth estate or the need for local reporting and how critical that is to democracy. Do you have any ideas on how we might change that? I do. Um, I, I think that's true to some extent. Um, I, I think that I'd like to see it be a part of curriculum, the curriculum in schools. I mean, I'd like to, I guess we used to talk about civics, but perhaps we can frame it differently and talk about media literacy or news literacy. And really, especially in this age of misinformation, to try to teach kids, you know, how do you find out if a news source is, is valid? And how do you compare and contrast? I mean, I think that would be really interesting for, for teachers to take up. And there are actually organizations like the News Literacy Project and others that have the, the material. So I think that would be one way to go at it. And I, you know, I honestly think that a lot of this is family oriented. How are we, you know, how are we bringing our kids along so that they are good citizens? I mean, sometimes we talk about news consumers because our society is so much a consumer society, but we're actually citizens and we owe it to ourselves to be well-informed. And so, you know, I think that comes from schools and it comes from families. And look, it also comes from personal responsibility. What kind of a citizen should I be in our country, in our society, and how can I be best informed? And I think if you do that, you're not going to simply be watching your Twitter feed or, you know, I'll sometimes say to younger people, how do you get your news? And they'll say, I don't know, like whatever's on my phone. I mean, I think we need to take a little bit more personal responsibility for being well informed. So I'd like to see that happen. So in writing this book, I'm sure you had one takeaway, but for the last month, you've had to talk about it a lot. Yes. Have your takeaways changed now that you've seen what other people's reaction are? And, and what is your uh, last piece that you would like to add to this? Well, the thing that, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book is that I know and other journalists know that our industry is in a state of turmoil, but most people don't really know that, or if they do know it, they don't know the extent of it. And so, you know, I think that through, you know, I've done a bunch of sessions like this one where I've taken questions. I'm always so impressed by the, as I am tonight, by the sophistication and the perceptiveness of the questions. Maybe that's just the audience you get when you do a book event. But um, I, you know, I guess it's a hope that I would express. My hope is that people understand what a dire situation this is and how much of a role they can have in it by supporting their local news organizations. Mara, thank you for, for being on with us. And I, I love the book. It was, it, you know, now granted, I, I had a vested interest in it, but boy, did I, I love it. And, and I hope that when this, this, this pandemic goes, that maybe we can convince you to come over to Spokane and do this proper. Because I don't know if you've heard, there are basically rock concerts. I mean, we have several hundred people show up. So I and they all ask smart questions like what you've gotten today. So Very I cool. hope you'll come back and join us. And if you I haven't thought, purchase her book, please, please do and get it at aunties. You know, I, I can't, but I, I love this. You'll love this too much. They actually advertise in our paper too. They used to not advertise it, but now they do. Now so they do. That's this great. virtuous circle is real, you know? Uh, so thank you so much. And you're and, welcome. It was a pleasure. Please come see us sometime. I will. All right. Thank Bye you. everybody.